Folks, welcome to an all new episode of So Bad It's Good with Ryan Bailey. This is your pal Ryan, and this is, I think, Wednesday. This is your Wednesday episode. Um, and I'm going to release a couple of episodes in succession. Sorry, I didn't release it this morning. Now, I was going to, there's an episode I did uh, that is a little more serious in nature, and I just didn't feel like putting it out yet uh, because it was just not where my mood was at. Um, So I hope you understand. Sorry about the delay, but uh, we're going to do a solo pop culture roundup because there's a lot of things that I want to talk about in terms of everything happening in the world of pop culture. There are things happening, actually, even though time has appeared to have frozen. uh, If you're at your parents' house or your house, that liminal period between Christmas and New Year's is always... uh, Uh, It's a a veritable shit show in your head of where you are, what day it is, what time is it, have I fed myself, all of those things until we're given permission to live free again when we hit the new year. Now, I know you're saying, listen, I don't do any of that. Good for you. You are a healthy, happy, uh, well-adjusted human being. Obviously, I am not. So uh, welcome to the show. How did everybody... I, I, I did a show, I think, on Christmas. So Hopefully your Christmas went well. Hopefully this period of time is going well for you. Um, uh, let's see here. The other uh, couple podcasts that I want to mention that I'm on uh, to check out is on, I'm on the new episode of Shenanigans with Miss Sheena Shea and Mrs. Sheena Shea and Kiki Monique at the Talk of Shame. Uh, and I think that was a lot of fun. It was like a lot of pop culture stories from the year. And I've told you before, it is always a trip to podcast with Sheena to sit across from her. Uh, it is uh, a trip. It is. Uh, I can't. It really it. it uh, I know t- <laughs> it tickles me. I know that's the weirdest way, but it, I do talk like a grandfather now. It does tickle me to do that podcast with her the couple of times I've been on. And it's a really good but I think we have a good flow and and Kiki, I always, I'm also I'm going to be on Kiki Monique's podcast, Pop Crime, uh, covering some of the more, uh, I think, criminal activities of the year in terms of pop culture. I think that should be out today or tomorrow. I'm not sure. And then there is this, a new podcast by uh, Ringer, the, the Ringer Reality TV. It's a Spotify podcast. And The Ringer is just a fabulous a bunch of podcasting people. If you haven't checked out their stuff, it's great. I know Zach Peters is over there, um, but I always, I always love the, what the ringer has always stood for. And I'm a huge fan of Bill Simmons is the one I believe who started the ringer. And if you don't know Bill Simmons, you know, he's primarily or started off, I think as a huge sports guy in terms of talking about sports, but his love of pop culture, of the real world, the challenge of dissecting uh, movies from the 80s, 90s. Uh, and today, he I just think he is second to none. And I know his home is over on Spotify, but I'm just a huge fan of him. But they have the ringer reality, but they did this uh, amazing Jody Walker put together this amazing three part series um, called, uh, let's see, let me pull it up here so I can talk about it with you guys. It's called Anatomy of a Scandal, um, an American, an American Scandal, uh, an Anatomy of a Scandal, uh, Scandal. It's a three part series. I think I appear in part two and part three, and I had such, such fun doing the interview with Jody. And I think that might be worth checking out. And I remember doing this interview. I think we did this a little bit ago. But it was wild to talk about this thing that we had just been so obsessed with and getting a little bit of distance on it. And I always find it interesting. And I've talked about that on this show is, you know, the story itself, I think we know a lot of the big pieces of it, even though I think uh, the artist formerly known as Raquel Rachel, I think we're going to hear more of her side of the story coming up soon uh, on her podcast because, you know, everything happens on podcasts nowadays. Um but I, I was shocked in talking to her about even my relation to the scandal in terms of how I feel about it now, as opposed to how I felt about it then and how it works with any kind of pop culture thing is that there's a white hot heat, a white hot spotlight on something. And then over time that kind of dissipates, even though there's little like little strings 
little strings that get left around that we can still kind of explode or pop up. And of course, with Vanderpump Rules season 11 starting January 30th, we're going to see that story that we've already seen on Instagram and social media and TikToks. We'll be able to see what they actually film. And it'll be interesting to put those pieces in it. Now, back in the you know, back in the olden days, we used to just have these shows and whatever the shows showed us was what we kind of saw. We kind of saw like a 180, you know, not the full picture, but a 180 of what production was trying to tell, what story they were trying to tell. And I think now with social media and it's good and bad is that there's more of a 360 view of something of, OK, well, we didn't see this part in the film, but we do know over here in reality, this did happen. But it's also interesting to see as an audience how, like I said, I relate to it, how you relate to it. Um, And there's a part of me as I think even after I did this interview where it just got to be exhaustive in the terms of, oh, my God, there's got to be new things to talk about. There's got to be, even though I know, I mean, that same excitement, that same fire is still there. It's just a little different. And I'm so curious about how season 11 will do. I think we'll all be watching it, right? But I'm curious if they're going to try to tell any new stories or it's going to be centered around uh, this scandal still. Now, of course, we know from the trailer, uh, Lala, and then, of course, we <laughs> miss Sheena being on the Hot Mic podcast and uh, talking about... Uh, talking about how hard it was for her. Um, and she was crying on that podcast. And I think it's going to be interesting to see how, not how we feel about Sandoval per se, but how we feel about Ariana. And it seems like, and if you think about your own lives, there's nobody in your own life, if they're getting so much attention, so much attention, that is bound to be a double-edged sword at a certain point, right? Like even if they're doing everything right, which I think Ariana did, everything right, everything right. And you know, what, who, who said it? Was it, was it Julia Fox or I'm trying to misquoting, but there is no perfect victim, right? There is no perfect victim. And for us to even, um, want that is, is weird, right? Is, is not really, that's not, there is no perfect victim. So, you know, we can't be judging, uh, how many, you know, how many spawn con can one person get, you know, like, well, it's too much. I I've always thought like, that's so ridiculous that I'm listening to people say, Oh, it's too much now. Or like, are you kidding me? You would take every opportunity that you could get to actually be able to make money to try to like, and all the spawn con that I think Ariana did was done, uh, with a little bit of humor. It was done well. I mean, dancing with the stars, Chicago, all of that stuff. But It's going to be interesting to see how her fellow castmates react to that because they're all people in the same business as well. And if you are in the same business, like, you know, therapists will always say compare and despair. Don't compare because it'll be despair. Don't compare with anybody because you're going to put yourself in a world of hurt. But even just being an actor a little bit myself over the last couple of decades, it's hard. It's hard not to look at what everybody else has and wonder why you don't have that. And I think even if they're not realizing it now, a couple of years from now, they'll probably have a little bit more perspective on this and their feelings. But I would imagine at first it's like, yeah, gung ho, gung ho. Ariana deserves whatever she wants, anything, anything. And then as that reality sinks in, you're like, well, why not me? And they're not sitting there thinking about, well, I wish I got cheated on. It's not like that. But you do just wonder. And we all know these characters, right? Right. You know, we know these people are going to feel that way at a certain point. That's not a surprise. When I heard Lala say that in the trailer, which, by the way, I know Kristen Doty spoke about this on her podcast, uh, and I, I I love Kristen. And, uh, uh, you know, she, she also pointed out, like, listen, she didn't agree with what, what Lala said in the trailer of, like, I've never seen, you know, this happen to somebody and all of a sudden they become God, is that on its face, that is a pretty damning quote. But we don't know the context of that, right? We don't know the actual situation that goes into that, right? I also still think that they are punking us a little bit with that Sheena and Tom Schwartz kiss. Now, we do know Tom Schwartz has kissed a lot of people in his day. I mean, we do know that. Um, But do we think he really kissed Sheena? I do think there's some Frankenstein editing going on there to make it look like something. Remember, all they do is film. They have no control over the final product. 
unless you're a Kardashian and then they do have full edit control. Um, so I think that's something important to keep in mind is that once all that footage is there, somebody cuts together a trailer to make us make memes, to make us talk about it on shows, to make us talk about it with our friends because they want to get us involved again. They want to have our attention on it. Now, the one thing I will say, and I know, like I said, this podcast is going to be all over the place today, you guys. It's going to talk about a lot of different things. So if you're, you want that, great. If not, totally get it. Um, is the one thing that I've grown to accept more over this last year in terms of production is I think with Scandaval, I think we all had this, like I said, white hot heat and a lot of it was hatred. A lot of it was shock. A lot of it was all of this stuff. And, you know, you thought, okay, is, you know, I mean, production, are they trying to destroy Tom? Are they trying to tell this? Or, you know, it was very, but after listening to many interviews with the producers, talking to actually some of the producers face to face, uh, watching their panel at BravoCon, which was really one of my favorite panels. I wish that had gone on way longer. And I hope BravoCon in the future does way more panels like that. What I started to accept, even if I didn't agree with, you know, who they backed and who they didn't, is that they truly do care about these people. They truly do care about this cast, all of them. And I know that's wild, right? Like, so even Sandoval, they care about, you know, even Sandoval, they're still concerned with, they're still hoping they're okay. And you say, okay, what about Rachel? Remember, they did reach out to Rachel many times. They did try to make it work with Rachel. Now, I totally understand and I almost applaud her not doing season 11, but I do worry about her putting herself back in the fray with the podcast. She's showing up at events and listen, she's done some of the work so she can do whatever she damn well pleases, right? That's part of being free. That's part of what we argued in the free Britney movement was, yeah, Britney makes some weird fucking Instagram posts. Have you seen some of your friends' Instagram posts? Fucking weird. Yes, Britney does a lot of twirls, maybe a little different than your friends. And she does have a lot of run-on sentences, but that's part of what being free is all about. They are able to do whatever they want. Now, unfortunately, as us commoners, you don't usually get people uh, talking, you know, like, you know, I'm not putting a spinning video up and people are like, oh, my God, dissecting the moves. What's going on with him? Oh, my God, he's crazy. But Brittany and people of the like have to deal with that every day. But that is part of being able to be free. So Rachel can do whatever she wants. Right. But I do understand a little bit more is. They do care about these cast members. I mean, I always talk about that one Vanderpump Rules documentary that I think it was like right before season six that it aired. I've still tried to find it. I don't know if you guys can find it. They attached it to an episode, but it was uh, kind of an hour long or like a 48 minute documentary about like the first season of Vanderpump Rules. And Andy was a part of it and, you know, talked about it getting pitched. And we remember that image where it kind of like was like a map, like Game of Thrones of this person's connected, this person, this person's dated, this person, this person's cheated on this person. And that's how one of the ways that they sold the show Vanderpump Rules. But then also it had Jeremiah, who at the time was part of the production, but wasn't a producer on the show. But producer Jeremiah, now a producer and killed it last season. He in that and I uh, he in that talks about that he completely believed Jax the entire season. Jax completely committed to the lie that they, there was no, uh, you know, the the, St the cheating stuff with Stassi didn't happen. And then at the final episode, Jax walked in with the flower, told Stassi, and the crew was shocked. The crew was shocked because they truly all believed Jax. And I was talking about that uh, momentarily with uh, producer Jeremiah when I went to that direct TV uh, variety uh, women in reality uh, thing a couple like a month and a half ago. And I just thought, how weird is that? And 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 hearing how they discovered about Sandoval and Scandoval and stuff like that, that's why I always push back on this is fake, this is phony, even though people still in my comments will not leave that alone of, oh, this is all scripted, this is all fake, this is all. And it's like, guys, you don't realize how much stuff goes into this, but not in the way that you think it does. And uh, I, I think sometimes it's great to not realize how much stuff or work goes into something because sometimes when you do, it takes a little bit of that magic away. It's like getting to know these people outside of the reality show. 
even for me, it takes a little bit of the magic away because when you're talking to Doty or when you're talking to Sandoval or when you're talking to Sheena or when I'm sitting across from her at a podcast, you know, seeing somebody and talking to them, even when the mics are off, it's a completely different experience than what you see. And yes, there are complete similarities of like, yes, I think they get Sheena to a T on that show. But then talking to her in person and getting to know a little bit more about what drives her and how she is, it, it kind of sometimes takes a little bit of that magic away. Does that make sense? Um, so, uh, yeah, anyways, I, I highly recommend that podcast on uh, on The Ringer. Uh, an American Scandal, a three-part series. I hope you guys enjoy it. I think uh, I'm really excited to finish listening to it. I just think it was really well, well, very well put together with the music and all. I just thought, well, well done, well done. So Pop Crime and American Scandal and Shenanigans, you can check me all out on. Okay. Um, listen, it, uh, this has obviously not been the easiest time for so many reasons, um, and, uh, like I said on the Christmas podcast or, uh, was that, you know, this has been a little bit more or not a little, a lot more difficult than Thanksgiving was. And, um, I think Thanksgiving, you know, there was this, I don't think, like I said, I don't think excitement is the right word, but there was this still not a rush of endorphins, but there was like, you know, going into battle, going into, you know, let's, let's just get through this. And I think Christmas has been a little bit more of resignation of, Okay, yeah, this uh, this hasn't changed, <laughs> you know. She, mom didn't automatically come. I didn't unwrap a special gift on Christmas, and she was back, you know. And I think that resignation ha has been the toughest part of that, of just that acceptance, you know. Three and a half months, you you know, you're just like accepting it. It becomes more and more real, even though I know it was real, you guys. Um. Uh. So what what we did uh, what we did today, we went to her. We went to the graveyard to her, uh, where her ashes are stored. And, uh, you know, it's not, uh, you guys know, and especially it's just not the most pleasant experience. It's, it, it really sucks. It reminds me of a feeling I had. I remember for Christmas, gosh, 17 years ago, maybe 50, I, I, I bought my, uh, one of my best friends, Patrick, I bought him a skydiving experience. We had always talked about it. So I said, you know, let's go. I, I had made a little commercial residual money on a TGI Fridays commercial. I did a ribs commercial for TGI Fridays back in the day. And you know who directed it was Janusz Kaminski, who won the, uh, the best cinematographer award uh, at the Oscars for, I think he won it twice. He won it for Schindler's List, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. And then I think he won or it was nominated for Saving uh, Private Ryan. Um, and, uh, he directed the TGI Friday's chili commercial, uh, the, the, the ribs commercial. And I always remember that was such a weird experience to be like, you know, Janusz behind the camera while we're eating these ribs, trying to act like we're having the best time of our lives. And it was so disgusting, you guys. And there was like a rib bucket. Like, so like you did so many takes, you would have to spit the thing that you're chewing and laughing. You would have spit it in a bucket once they yelled cut. But I remember Janusz at the time was married to Holly Hunter, who's one of my favorite actors. Uh, he would, I remember behind the camera, he would be like, Ryan, Ryan, I just did a film. I did a film with uh, the, the name of Ryan in it. And I'm like, yeah, it's the Saving Private Ryan. Like it was, it was just the weirdest experience. And they had built a whole TGI Fridays restaurant on a soundstage at Universal Studios. And it was just a mind blowing experience. I'm like, I get to work with one of my heroes, not in the way I want to, but on a ribs commercial. And that, that at its crux is Hollywood. It's all shiny and bright, but it's never truly what you think or want it to be when you're a kid. If that, you know, like it was just one of, it was just really one of those bizarre experiences, but I was obviously so happy to have the job, but I made this residual money and I got uh, Patrick, the skydiving experience. And I remember we went on a Sunday, a Sunday morning and the night before we were at a Barney's Beanery and we were joking about, Oh, this is our last, this is our last drink. Who knows what's going to happen. But I will tell you, you know, we were kind of jokey about it, but that drive to, uh, I think it was by magic mountain where we went, it was the most somber drive. Uh, you know, one of the most somber drives you're going to have. I remember we listened to like Rilo Kylie, the sad stuff on Rilo Kylie and, uh, Fleetwood Mac. You know, I remember listening to land, Landslide on the way there. And it was this thing, this thing of just not wanting to go all of a sudden, of not wanting to go. And that reminds me 
every time I've driven to the the graveyard or the gravesite or whatever the true thing you're going to call it. And here, listen, this is my hot take. And this might be really controversial and you guys might disagree with this is uh, I don't like the gravesite. I don't like the graveyard. I don't like being there. I don't know necessarily what it does except kind of gives you a sucker punch again and again and again. And you do your little breakdown and, you know, watch your dad cry. And, um, and the thing is, I just sometimes think, what is this for? It's like, you guys know, you carry around your loved ones every day for the rest of your life. You know, I carry around my mom every day. There's not an hour I don't think about her in some way. And that wasn't before she was even sick. I, I was like that. And that's how I'm going to be until the day I die. And I don't know if I necessarily think, and it's, it's so wild, you guys, because, you know, it's the opposite of going to see Christmas lights because every uh, little grave uh, plot is decorated with holiday decorations. And, you know, it's just the opposite of like, mom always wanted to take us out to go see Christmas lights every year. And it's just the the exact opposite. You know, that was always joyous and like, oh, but this is just looking around at a bunch of red and tinsel and flowers and things, but it's at a graveyard. And I know that there's something in there that you're going to say, oh, it's joyous and it's a celebration or it could be. And it's just, it's not there yet. Uh, but I did bring, I brought my mom's favorite Costco wine, her Malbec. She bought it in cases, you guys. And uh, I brought her a full bottle of that and we each uh, took a sip out of it and I poured a little out. But if anybody needs three quarters of a bottle of a $7 Malbec wine, I can direct you to uh, a cemetery in Chandler that you can pick up something for the new year. It should still be good because it's a little chilly outside. I don't know. It, 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 uh, it's one of those things that kind of messes with you and it just makes your stomach uh, drop. And really uh, put you in a weird, weird place. So anyways, wanted to talk about that just because I know a lot of people were asking about that. Um, and now on to some fun stuff. Let's uh, let's talk about some fun stuff. Let's talk about those kooky Kardashians. Um, you know, seriously, eat the rich, you guys. Eat the rich. It is becoming more ridiculous. Their holiday Christmas party every year. Uh, we had a little bit of a downtime because of the pandemic, but we are back in full force. And I don't know, because I think the Kardashians now are in uncharted territory in terms of celebrity and wealth. Um, you know, we could point back to a time of, say, like the Rockefellers and things like that. But remember, the Rockefellers and these rich families, they didn't have reality shows and we didn't have social media. So you only read about these things. And when you read about it and not see it, it's a whole different experience. But this, their holiday parties are a celebration, obviously, for themselves and their friends and family. But it's obviously also to show us, to show us. And I think the question remains sometimes as they get wealthier and the gifts and the parties become more extravagant is what are they trying to show us? Is this aspirational? And we see all of the pain that their family has gone through through the years. Uh, is this comeuppance for that? You know, is this, well, this happened to us, so we get this. But you also have to remember is it aspirational anymore? That's something that I will say every couple episodes, because I think there was a time that uh, we had convinced ourselves that celebrities were aspirational. And I just don't necessarily think we are in that place anymore, because I don't know if I would trade anything to be them. Um, I mean, even, you know, th they're now at a place where they have to show us the way they wrap their holiday presents. We had to see that Kim was uh, being eco-friendly and, and, and wrapping all of her gifts in white, the same packaging that all of her skims comes in. So she did a nice little cross promotion there, but also was let us, let us know that she's eco-friendly. But then Chloe had a specific sort of wrapping paper. Courtney did, had a specific set of wrapping paper. They all had specific sets of their own wrapping paper. And I also wonder how many people they employ during this time because Listen, I think maybe there's a world in which Chloe wraps one gift by herself, but the rest, like they must have team meetings. And sometimes we've seen that on the reality show, which this season of the Kardashians on Hulu, I know a lot of people don't watch it, but I thought it was really, really fascinating in a lot of ways. But I do wonder if, at some point, since they are on hallowed ground that not a lot of people have watched, uh, not a lot of people have walked, walked, where is it going to go from here? Like, I, I don't know because it's getting bigger and bigger and 
you know, are they going to make huge mistakes? Maybe. I mean, it's not going to be smooth sailing, but like at this point, remember, the Kardashians are now an institution, whether you like it or not. They will be rich for the remainder of their days, your days, and future, future generations. What I always say about the Kardashians, though, is there's going to be one. There's going to be one rebel. And, you know, I, I would say maybe it's Rob, but I think Rob is genuinely a little bit lazy. So I don't think he's going to make a stink. I have my eye on Northwest. Uh, it's going to be very curious to see. Uh, we've seen how she is growing up, but one is going to write a tell all. One is going to write a tell all that's going to knock us off our coal mining asses. It is going to be insane. And we're going to know more details. But they've spawned so many iterations of their family that one, is not going to love it. One is not one is going to rail against the way they were raised. And when especially they see how the rest of the world is. And I think that's going to be the interesting thing that that's what I'm talking about aspirational is that none of us would possibly ever want to deal with that. Could you imagine? I see some of you guys, it's hard enough to potty train your kids. Imagine having to explain to them at this point generational wealth in the year 2023 and how now they are part of the political socioeconomic discussion. They are part of the discussion in terms of our government. I mean, you see Kim Kardashian now buddying up to Ivanka again, even though they've been friends forever, you guys, but now feeling free to take more photos out there, you know, with them together. And I think in some way, Kim is hedging her bet. Kim's always that person that's, I'm going to say, middle of the road, you know, like, hey, I like Democrats, also like Republicans. It's going to work out for me either way. And you could disagree with this, but I do think there is some truth to this. So they had their, uh, their Kardashian Jenner Christmas Eve party. And uh, I'm pulling some articles here from Daily Mail, some things I've seen online. Now, this is the Daily Mail headline uh, Kim Kardashian and Paris Hilton sled in fake snow while guests are treated with a special performance by Babyface at annual event, which was even sponsored by Coca Cola. That's right, folks. The Kardashians don't have enough fluid money to pay for this party by themselves. They brought a sponsor on this year and they even made these Coca Cola bottles that said, like, Kardashian Jenner Christmas Eve Party 2023, which I would love to get my hands on one of those. Wouldn't that be a great collector's items? Like, I love that's where I it's aspirational for me, not just, you know, them, but just I want I want it for my reality show museum. Um, they had bottles made. So Coca-Cola sponsored this event because once again, it's about what they're showing us. It's not really, you know, part of it is of course for the love of their friends and family in the holiday, but also it's a brand opportunity. It's like Kim Kardashian bringing up skims underneath her Christmas tree. Uh, you know, Coca-Cola is getting their money's worth. I'm talking about it. It's in articles everywhere. And I think, of course, there's that part of me that go, well, if I was that rich, I would just do it all on my own. I wouldn't want help from anybody. But yeah, Chris has never been known to turn away free money. And she definitely didn't do it here. Um, but it is interesting just to see the scale of this party and how much goes into it where they're even bringing in fake snow everywhere to go sledding. And I just think it's magical, but I do think it's got to fuck you up as a kid eventually to realize my mom brought in fake snow. Wait, are you telling me, Jimmy, that I'm in middle school with? Your parents didn't bring in fake snow. They didn't import all the fake snow. Like there's probably a fake snow shortage because of this Kardashian-Jenner Xmas Eve party. But I mean, that's just not how the majority of the world works. And that's why I sometimes say eat the rich billionaires shouldn't exist. Sorry. I know that's going to piss a lot of my billionaire listeners. I'm so sorry. I hope you understand. Uh, so this event took place in their hometown of Calabasas, California, which I do think eventually they should just buy. They, and I don't mean a house. They should buy all of Calabasas. Chris should buy all of Calabasas. It should be a little fiefdom. They should secede from the union. It should just be their own thing. It's just kind of like how I say with Bachelor Nation, eventually they should just make it an actual nation and we just ship all of the Bachelor and Bachelorette contestants to some island or some area, some big plot of land and just let them plant a flag and call it a day. Because I feel like I say, I'm just going to keep worrying about them for the rest of my life. If, you know, but if they secede, if they actually start their own thing, I feel like, okay, that's their business then. But I do hope, I do hope Chris buys Calabasas one day. Um, so Kylie Jenner and her daughter Stormy were there, um, Kim and Paris Hilton. Now I will say uh, this Landon, I believe it was Landon, uh, Travis Barker's son. Uh, which we'll talk about because he had a very good Christmas in terms of what he was given from Santa. 
But Landon posted a photo, and in the background, you see Timothy Chalamet, Chalamet, Timothy Chalamet, Timothy Chalamet, uh, talking to Miss Kylie Jenner. So that's another thing. You know, now they have their hands in so much different entertainment circles that so many pop culture stories are just coming out of this holiday party. Now, Timothy Chalamet and Kylie Jenner, their romance has been kept. There's been a lid on it, right? There's not been a lot of public. Uh, we don't have a lot of public consumption of that. They were at a tennis match where we saw them kiss. We saw them smoking cigarettes at a Beyonce Renaissance concert in uh, in Inglewood. And uh, we saw, we know that Kylie went over for the Wonka London premiere. And we had somebody on our show. We had uh, uh, we had Emily Orozco from, uh, Orozco from Access Hollywood let us know that she saw Kylie Jenner in the elevator after she did her interview with Hugh Grant and Timothy Chalamet. So she is popping up to these events. She is flying her private jet over there. I mean, she's not personally flying it in a pilot, but she's bringing her jet over. And we had word that Timothy Chalamet wasn't there and that they weren't together. That was a thing I, I heard from Club Chalamet, which is the Number one source for your Timothy Chalamet news. Uh, and it turns out she's usually wrong. But Timothy, uh, Timothy Chalamet was there. He was at this event. We saw them talking. And uh, I think at this point, we just have to accept that this is a real relationship. She has gone from Travis Scott to Timothy Chalamet. And I think they are uh, very similar in that uh, they're both famous. And I think that's what it takes in this day and age. You got to be famous if you're going to date a Kardashian Jenner. And I know a lot of girls are kind of accepting of this relationship. And I know some people are still like, what the fuck? But I think we just have to accept that it is what it is, that it is what it is. They seem to dig each other. I do want Timothy Chalamet in 2024 to chill out on the clothing. Uh, he was getting a little bit in his Eddie Murphy delirious red leather jumpsuit era with some of the brand. Like he's just wearing a lot of freshly just <laughs> freshly made leather. I just, the smell that Kylie and Timothy must emanate when they're together. It just must, it just, must, it's got to smell like rawhide. It's just got to, it's got to smell just like, just, just fresh leather. It's just like, oh my God, am I at a leather outlet? This is wild. So they're obviously doing their thing, but I don't know how much we'll ever find out about that because Timothy Chalamet, even though he's, you know, very much talked about, he still wants to be and is a serious thespian, a thespian, an actor. He want, He's gunning for the Oscar one day. Uh, and it's going to be interesting, too, because, you know, one of his next roles, he's playing a young Bob Dylan. He is doing the, a Bob Dylan biopic. Yeah, I'm Bob Dylan. What's going on? By the way, my Bob Dylan, uh, my, just so to let you know, my Erica Jane. I'm Erica Jane. What's going on? So my Erica Jane is just me doing Bob Dylan, but I pinch my nose. But Bob Dylan to me is like, I'm Bob Dylan. I'm doing poetry. I'm doing. So that's that's a little trick of the trade, you guys, if you're trying to do your own Bob Dylan or Erica Jane impressions. But he's playing a young Bob Dylan. And nothing makes me laugh harder than thinking about Timothy Chalamet playing early recordings of Bob Dylan. Like going from Kylie having to listen to Travis Scott to Kylie potentially having to listen to Bob Dylan. Like, oh my God, I would love to see Kylie Jenner go through a Bob Dylan phase. Wouldn't that just be incredible? Because, I mean, you know, you know, Bob Dylan is a tough listen for those who aren't used to aren't initiated into Bob Dylan. Like I had a Bob Dylan phase where I listened to everything he did. I wrote, I read the uh, biography. I read his book. I watched documentaries on him. I think everybody, it's important to have a Bob Dylan phase to really appreciate what he meant to music. And I wonder if Kylie's going to go through that too. Now the Kardashians, I know I'm talking a lot about the Kardashians, but Hey, we're here. Um, the other funny thing that they do is, you know, Courtney was especially guilty of this is they would always wear band shirts of bands that there's no way in fucking hell that they listen to. Maybe Courtney now because of Travis, like she's wearing more suicidal tendency shirts, that band. And I know Travis is a huge fan of that. And I believe they named Rocky after is the drummer in suicidal tendencies. I could be mistaken on that, you guys. Um, but uh, Courtney, you know, you'd see Kim in a Metallica shirt and I'm like, uh, Kim, do you like Ride the Lightning? Well, I know you might know Enter the Sandman, but do you know for whom the bell tolls, Kim Kardashian? Okay, so anyways, this party is happening. Uh, all the fake snow in Calabasas is over there. And uh, 
the property was aligned with several lit Christmas trees. And we're talking the fanciest, uh, the fanciest of trees. Now, inside the bash, it was decorated with logs stacked up very high. And there were massive gingerbread houses constructed. Logs stacked up very high. This is good because they can reuse this for the end of the world. It's, you know, they'll be able to use this for firewood. Um, this event, like I said, was sponsored by Coca-Cola. We have pictures of Kim and... Paris and couture gowns sledding down fake snow, sledding down fake snow. Beautiful. Now, another thing, the family pulled out all the stops, including a performance by R&B icon Babyface, Kenneth Babyface Edmonds. Now, this guy, obviously insanely talented, but I sometimes worry about Babyface because it feels like his schedule is packed with just doing things for his friends. Like, please tell me Babyface got paid for this. I mean, I know he's friendly with all of these people, but it reminded me, remember in Real Houses of Beverly Hills when David Foster would always have Babyface there? You know, like we're tinkling around the keys on the piano in Malibu and it'd be like Babyface or he, you know, David Foster would do a lot of his concerts and Babyface would be there. And I'm like, man, I want Babyface to get back to making Babyface music so people can make babies to Babyface music. But the fact that he's out there just at these holiday parties, they like they trot him out for these holiday parties. Like Babyface seems to be at every kind of function that is not surrounding his own music implicitly. Like it's always some event. Um, I don't know. I just think that's interesting. So uh, let's see. What else here is the uh, the stories? A lot of stories were shared to social media about this. The uh, Kylie and Stormy, they were in custom Dolce Gabbana gowns. Uh, you know what? And five years old, I got my first Dolce at seven. So I think five, it's a little early. It feels like bad parenting, maybe. I mean, have you ever, I mean, the Kardashians don't, do they even know about Old Navy? Do they think it's just like a funny commercial that doesn't exist? Do they know these things exist? And do they ever want to cosplay as us? Like, is like, what is Chicago ever like, come on, can you take me to Old Navy? Like, like, honestly, it, it, it seems like something that is in the making. Now you've seen some of these pictures and they are just insane. Chris Jenner is out and about. We do know Tristan Thompson was there. He was allowed to come. Um, we had Faye Resnick there, uh, one of Chris Jenner's really good friends. Uh, we had somebody dressed up as the Grinch there. Uh, the Grinch probably was Caitlin. It's me, Caitlin. What's you? I'm the Grinch. <laughs> I still get an invite. <laughs> yeah, baby. Woo. Um, one of Kylie's BFFs, Anna Stasia Stasi, however you say her last name was there. Uh, Kendall Jenner was there. They did this kind of um, TikTok video where each of the ladies uh, lip synced to Ariana Grande. Kim was not able to be in that one, but the rest of them did. Um, Courtney, of course, was there. Courtney, remember, it's been two months since she's given birth. Uh, Entertainment Tonight did an article on her today saying the the ways Courtney has been able to um, to become more beautiful two months into her postpartum journey. And I was like, the, the way is the way is having money. That's the main way. Uh, Chloe was there. Chloe looked beautiful. I mean, Chloe looked really beautiful. Um, that's the other thing though. When I watch these TikTok videos with Kylie and so I wonder what Timothy thinks of that. Like, Oh, it's cool. It's cool. Like, I wonder if he just like, I wonder what his take on their brand overall is because you know, he had to have had a take to begin with. And I'm sure, like I said, once you get to know a person, that of course is going to change. But I still think overall, that's wild. Also, thankfully, uh, Kanye West was not there. And listen, there's been a lot of Kanye West stuff in the news. I'm just not going to talk about it. I'm not going to talk about it to, you know, you guys consume his stuff, how you want to consume his stuff. And you believe whatever you want to believe in regarding Mr. Mr. West. Um, Nikki Hilton was there. Now, the Calabasas, the temperature, it says, was a brisk 42 degrees, um, and everybody was just having a rich, gay old time And uh, before they jetted off to Palm Springs, where they all have mansions now. Uh, and congratulations to all of <laughs> Congratulations to all of them. Okay. Now, here is something great uh, in terms of Travis Barker and Kourtney Kardashian, what did they get their kids, pray tell you? I know a lot of you guys got great gifts out there. Well, Alabama Barker, who is 18, she got a $25,000 Hermes bag. 
And she posted in a caption, your girl got her first Birkin. Now, you know, 18 years old, once again, she beat me. I got my first Birkin, Birkin at 19. So jealous there. Um, this was a Birkin 30 in white Togo leather with palladium hardware, which t- typically retails for around $25,000, but can go for closer to $35,000 or more. I was having the Birkin process uh, explained to me about, you know, you have to get on this list. You can't just go into a store. It's like a shopping experience, and these are high in demand. But don't worry, folks. Alabama didn't just get one gift. She got two because Travis Barker also gifted Alabama and her brother Landon their own Mercedes Benz G wagons, which cost a minimum of one hundred and fifty thousand dollars each. Alabama posted on her social media, "What the fuck?" And she wrote, "I love you." God, that must have a. It would have been, "I love you," and like eight billion exclamation points. Imagine waking up Christmas morning, not only an Hermes bag, but also a hundred and fifty thousand dollar G wagon. Now, do you think, you know, if these people are used to these kind of gifts, do you think Landon got jealous that he didn't get some brand of Hermes? Like, do you think they keep score of like that? Of like, okay, you got a $150,000 car. I got a $150,000 car. You got a $25,000 purse. I got an iTunes gift card. Oh my God, I'm pissed. It just seems a lot, right? It seems extravagant. And I don't know what your take on this, how you relate to this, how it makes you feel. Like, are you just genuinely excited? I know some people just love to see the extravagance. And a lot of people say this about Real Housewives as well. Like, oh, bring back the wealth. I want to see the opulence. Oh, I love seeing the wealth. But at a certain point, I think, just like talking about Ariana earlier, do we eventually get to the point of, well, you've had too much, right? You've had too much. And it's not just having too much. It's showing that you have too much. And what our relationship with that is now as opposed to what it was. And that's why I constantly talk about this stuff because I find it fascinating of not just where we are, but where are we possibly going to go? How much bigger is going to get? Because they are just adding billions. I'm talking billions on top of billions. I mean, Kim Kardashian, remember, she is now in financial markets. She has her own wealth group that she is starting, like in terms of investing for other people. I mean, it is wild. And all of this because Kim just doesn't want to sit down and take the actual bar. She will do anything not to become a lawyer. She will She will do movies and TV. She will throw everything in her path just so she never has to take that bar. She took the baby bar, took her a couple of times, but she did it and she passed. But now she's like, Fuck that. Hardest I ever worked in my life. I would rather start a wealth management group, do three movies, two TV shows, and plan parties, do my skims. And that should be enough, right? But it'll always be that thing that I think will always be like, what happened to the bar, Kim? Or maybe just me, because that's me. Man, I just get going. I can't stop. We're we're already 42 minutes in, and I only hit two or three stories. Okay, moving on. Uh, This is kind of... uh, Potentially troubling news is that uh, Pete Davidson uh, seems like he is potentially having a rough time again. Um, He canceled all of his shows unexpectedly. He canceled a dozen shows uh, starting last week and running through the new year. And uh, that is uh, obviously horrible. We know he struggles with mental health, with bipolar disorder, uh, which he has been very brave and open about. Um, uh, But then we're also getting a report that he reportedly trashed his trailer on the set of his uh, new movie, Riff Raff, that he's uh, filming with Bill Murray and Ed Harris. Now, In Touch Weekly is reporting, and take this with a grain of salt, folks, that he recently had a confrontation with a photographer who tried to get a shot of him with co-stars Bill Murray and Ed Helms. Um, Davidson was restrained by multiple people on the production crew before retreating to his trailer, which he then trashed. Now, this is a quote from somebody who remained nameless, so take it with a grain of salt. He's a good guy and everyone likes him, a source told the outlet. Also mentioning that Davidson regularly smokes marijuana. He's obviously going through something right now and people are worried about him. So uh, I think with Pete Davidson, obviously, that is something that we all worry about him. He seems like a good guy, but he also seems like somebody that, like a lot of us, has mental health uh, issues. And, you know, he's been to rehab multiple times um, for sometimes, un, you know, which he doesn't have to share with us why he's going to rehab. But it seems like he's actively or has tried to actively work on his mental health. Um, but I will say 
after re-listening to Matthew Perry's autobiography, which did you know on Spotify right now, if you have a premium account, you have access to audiobooks. This isn't a plug. It's just something I'm using now. Uh, you have access to their audiobook collection. But Matthew Perry's autobiography, Friends, Lovers, and the Big Terrible Thing, a memoir, I started re-listening to once, uh, once that information came out last week uh, about... Uh, what was found in his system. It's a really tough listen. And, you know, I think what surprised me the most is even though I knew about Matthew Perry's, uh, you know, supposed issues over the years and what he was dealing with, I didn't know the extent of it. And he is very open and honest in this memoir, but he really was dealing with a deadly disease of addiction, like deadly. You know, he talks about in this one story when, you know, before he had started on the pills and stuff, when drinking was still doing it for him, when that was enough, was that he had come home from a night of drinking. And usually that would be enough. And he just had this insane urge to keep drinking. It felt like his brain was on fire. He needed it, needed it. But he's like, it was five in the morning. You know, it was five in the morning. It's not, he, but he felt he never, he just he couldn't get it out of his head. And the thing about somebody struggling with that day in, day out for their entire life, and then having to go through uh, medical emergencies because of this that deteriorated his system, his body, and to come from such high highs, of course, of being on friends that never really fully satisfied him because like a lot of us, he was broken you know, at a young age and that he spent a lot of his life trying to fix that. you know, And of course, anybody... Uh, the, when we turn to drugs and alcohol, it is like a solve. It's like a bomb. It's like something to quell everything in your body and your mind to try to take you away from all of these big, big feelings and big, big emotions. And, you know, I, I've had, uh, I've had two and a half drinks since I've been here. And that's very little for me around this time of year. And uh, it's been important to kind of sit in those things. But I, I thinking about Pete Davidson is that it's not one of these things that you can just let it slide. It's like it, it's like a diet. You know, it's like you have to work on this every day for the rest of your life. And just that thought can be sometimes so daunting and so depressing that it's hard to move forward. It's hard to move forward because if you know that you're going to have to face this struggle, this pain, and some days, of course, it's easier than others then that's really hard to get through life. And you're looking sometimes for any escape to just make yourself feel better. And you're cursing yourself. Why aren't you normal? Why don't you think like other people do? Why that, you know, it's a lot of self-blame, self-harm. And sometimes that can exhibit in really harmful ways towards other people. So he canceled all those shows. We still don't know exactly why, but obviously Pete Davidson is going through something very big. So please keep him in your thoughts this holiday season, because this thing, it doesn't get better. You know, it's one of those things, like I said, you constantly have to work on. Now, uh, here's something interesting uh, and really sad as well. We'll get to some fun stuff in a second, is that uh, the actor Lee Sun Kyun um, found dead at 48. Now, you might not recognize his name, but you probably have seen or have heard about a film that he was in. Uh, he starred in the Oscar winning film Parasite that I believe won Best Picture three years ago, or was it four years ago? <laughs> the pandemic is a little, it's hard for me to remember those times. Um, so uh, he was found dead in uh, uh, Korea. He was a familiar face on Korean television. And of course, in that Oscar winning uh, film Parasite, he was uh, found dead in Seoul. He was, like I said, only 48 years old. Now, the interesting thing here. Uh, they found his body in a parked vehicle in central Seoul just before 11 a.m. yesterday. And there was allegedly like charcoal briquettes or like burning briquettes or something. So it is being investigated as a probable suicide. Um, trigger warning about that, talking about suicide. I think I'm supposed to say that before I say the word suicide. So I'm very sorry. Uh, they found his body using the location location signal from his phone and that his wife uh, let us know that he appeared to have left a suicide note. Um, now, the thing about this that gets a little darker was that uh, this had been going on for a couple of months, was that he was suspected of using illicit drugs. 
And you're saying, oh, well, okay, well, didn't we just talk about Pete Davidson or Matthew Perry? They're not, you know, they weren't in criminal trouble for this. But uh, remember that the freedoms that we have in America and the way we view certain recreational drugs are not the way the rest of the world does that. And South Korea has one of the strictest approach towards drugs. Um, and uh, they can be prosecuted for using illicit drugs, even if they have done so abroad. Um, and they are very strict. Now he had just got finished over a, get this, a 19 hour interrogation last week by authorities. Now this had been going on for a couple months. This wasn't the first time they've interrogated him about drug use. And, uh, you know, it's, it's wild. And this wasn't even, you know, I'm not trying to judge drugs, but it wasn't like this cocaine, like he was supposedly at an after hours thing with a cocktail server, if I'm not mistaken. And she took video of him of drugs that she had allegedly given him. I believe one being marijuana and, uh, um, and, and it was, I guess, shown to authorities. And his defense was that he thought he was doing, uh, uh, he thought he was being given a sleeping pill, which probably, you know, obviously is not the truth to that matter, but also he probably didn't want to go to jail. And I think all of this potentially was too much on him. And, uh, you know, he unfortunately took his life um, because of all of this stuff. But imagine, you know, smoking some marijuana or doing a bump of something and then having to be interrogated over the course of months again and again and again and potentially face jail time. Um, and, uh, he, he, you know, might have taken his own life and that made me so sad. And if you haven't seen the movie Parasite, I believe it's on Netflix. Uh, if not, it's on HBO max and it is just a beautiful film. Sometimes foreign films for me are hit or miss in just terms of, I don't like to read, uh, subtitles, but it is just an amazing film, an amazing, amazing film that definitely deserved the Oscar. And this guy had a bright career, a very talented actor. So wanted to, uh, to put out my thoughts, uh, my thoughts and prayers, the horrible thing that you say when anything happens, thoughts and prayers. Um, okay. So that is, uh, that's that we can move on from that. Let's get back to some happy stuff. Hey, let's delve into this Alexis Bellino, Johnny J or John Jansen. He's not John Jansen anymore. He's Johnny J. Johnny J and the Rebels, Johnny J. So Alexis, I told you the other day on the podcast, she had just posted this thing. Uh, it was a $14,000. Let me pull this up, actually, because um, I don't know tons about jewelry, and I've been being informed about it today, was uh, Johnny J allegedly, well, no, Johnny J did supposedly get, I keep saying supposedly and allegedly, just don't want to get in trouble. Uh, got her this $14,000 ring, a $14,000 ring. And she added Van Cleef uh, Arpels, Van Cleef Arpels, Van Cleef Arpels, you guys. So, you know, wow, he spent this much money uh, and the hashtag was promise. Like it's a promise ring. Now we do know Alexis Bellino, she is gunning for a slot on Real Housewives of Orange County, which we talked about the other day. Johnny J, disgusting. Don't like him at all. Don't like him at all. Um, but then face reality 16, the amazing Instagram account, she posted this today and said, nothing says true love, like an undercover promoted post. I'm curious how they get away with this with the FTC guidelines. The FTC requires you to disclose when you have a financial employment, personal or family relationship with a brand. It's about making sure your followers are aware when you've been paid or given something of value to promote a product, as opposed to recommending a product because you simply like it. Now, like I'd said, like when I promoted direct TV in the past, uh, I always had to put like a uh, uh, direct TV creator or like, and I have to put like a hashtag ad or when I did the Hollywood house lift, Jeff Lewis, TikTok video, that wasn't even through Jeff Lewis. That was through uh, Amazon freebie. And I had to put that I was paid for that. And I was very happy. And I've been lucky because the things that I have been paid for, I've actually liked, but uh, she posts this, that like this was potentially spawn con. And that this was given now a lot of people, cause I reposted this on my Instagram. A lot of people came into my DMS and said, listen, this is, there's no fucking way that this is uh spawn con. And I was like, why is this not, wh why, why is this not spawn con? And, uh, I'm trying to find the, uh, okay. So it says, 
I just have to say there is no way Van Cleef paid her to post this. They make enough money and do not need random Alexis Bellino to get them business. I'm just saying. There's just no way they need her business. And it's quite literally comical. I'm saying what every woman is thinking when it comes to luxury jewelry like Van Cleef. She wishes they would sponsor her. So that's very interesting. I don't know a lot, but obviously Van Cleef is a very respected jewelry brand. So they're probably not just giving out rings to Alexis Bellino, who hasn't even been recast on Orange County. So I think that is, and this is, by the way, that's nothing to do with face reality. I think that's a great post. That is something that is very worth looking into. Uh, but a lot of people came into my DM saying no fucking way in hell. So that's, that's that on that. But if you look at it from a macro sense in terms of pop culture, in terms of campaigning to get back on these shows, which I always talk about these housewives wanting to do. Might she do the same thing with SponCon? Might she say, hey, I want to put it out there that maybe they sponsored me, that maybe I've got pull even with Van Cleef. Like she's not officially on Orange County yet, but if she keeps putting it out there, if she keeps being shown with Johnny J and that how this romance is blossoming so fast, you know, magically right before filming starts in January. Well, what is that? You know, like I think putting it out there, you're letting us, the viewer make our own decision, but you're leading us in the direction that you want us to think. And I think that's, what's fascinating. So if she's going to do it with spawn con, she might do it with relationships, whatever works. Now I'm not saying that Johnny, Johnny J and Alexis Blino have not done the hippity dippity. I think there's a world in which two things can be true at once in terms of that. It's just like Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift. I don't think it's a PR relationship per se. I think it's as real as it can be for them, but it's inherently going to be a PR relationship. And I don't think Taylor or Travis minds that we actually get excited about that. It helps everything. I, unfortunately, it doesn't seem to help Travis Kelsey's game. Hey, oh, that's a sports joke. Even though I don't really watch sports, the Kansas City Chiefs lost again, you guys. Sorry to all the Chiefs fans out there. Um, so I thought that was something interesting. Keep your eye on what comes next. Uh, cause it is very, it's, it's very interesting. Also, um, Andy Cohen folks, Andy Cohen, uh, we are now, uh, looking towards his triumphant return to CNN new year's Eve spectacular that him and Anderson Cooper co-host. Uh, now there was a little bit of hot water. He was not able to drink last year because the year before he got potentially too, uh, hammered and was a little sloppy on air. I loved it, but a lot of people, I guess, complained. Um, and so they put the kibosh down and said he can't drink. But now he's been pushing to drink again. He's been pushing to have some celebratory tequila shots with Mr. Anderson Cooper, a respected journalist. And uh, I'm all for it. But I said today is that will Andy Cohen drink on New Year's Eve is becoming the new uh, will the ground groundhog see his shadow. And if it doesn't see his shadow, we have six more weeks of winter. Like it, it is that it is becoming that of like, I feel like if we can get Andy Cohen to drink on CNN, potentially 2024 is going to be a great start. If we don't get him to drink on CNN, we're going to have more misery. It's going to be more misery. And I'm saying this with it. This is a joke, you guys. So I'm not literally saying this, but it, I don't mind that kind of thing. But you know what's the interesting thing too? Like, how are you like the Andy Cohen stuff? This is another thing as we close out the year here. I sometimes don't understand people's relationship with Andy Cohen because I truly love that man. I don't think he would pay me to, I don't think he would give a shit about me, but I love that dude. I love his hosting. Um, I sometimes wish he would go harder in reunions, but this dude has been doing it from day one. There's only so many people in the industry that can say they actually created their own lane. They, that they actually created something that has become in a universal lexicon of the housewives. You know, only so many people get to do that. You know, in some ways, he is the Steve Jobs of reality television in certain circles. And please don't come at me for this because I truly believe it. But I think what he does, I think his, you know, the way he hosts, I think he brings a lively, fun, energetic way. But I mean, I'll post something about Andy Cohen and all I get is like 30 people saying something fucking nasty about him and what he's done and what he's done. I just, I sometimes don't know what people want. I don't know what people want from other people. Like, you, you, I don't know. I don't know. I get sometimes so confused about it. It's like, oh, damn. It's like, you just can't please everybody. But I, I, I love that dude. And I love when he would drink on there and make Anderson do his little giggle. He like Anderson has that tiny little giggle. I truly enjoy and look forward to that. And yes, you can bring up, um, 
you can bring up my life on the D list um, with with Kathy. You, you know, I know they had a falling out, and Kathy Griffin, of course, was one of the original hosts of CNN. And there is a infamous TMZ interview. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, Andy, Andy, um, what do you think of um? Uh, okay, okay, what do you think of Kathy Griffin? And Andy was like. Uh, I don't know her. I don't know her. And it was like really snotty and bitchy. And, you know, we all have our bad days and we all feel like lashing out at people that have talked shit about us. And obviously they have a personal relationship. But and also I would love a world in which Kathy Griffin and Andy Cohen could make up one day. I would love a world in which that would happen. I would love a world in which Kathy Griffin uh, with Danini Leakes and Andy could make up. I do not want a world where Bethany Frankel and Andy Cohen make up. But anyways, Uh, I wanted to bring up that we still do not have word. I'm sure we will get official word. Like I'm more interested in him drinking than I am me drinking. Uh, I just truly do look forward to that, which really, like I said, says a great deal. Um, Okay. What else as we're going down, trying to get through this list here? Um, Oh, I wanted to throw this little thought out in terms of Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Kyle Richards seems to be on a PR campaign right now, or just everybody's fixated on her. She's constantly in page six. Mauricio as well. Mauricio was partying with pop star Anita on the Aspen Slopes. And uh, that uh, that the YouTube influencer, uh, what's your name, who was on Dancing with the Stars, you know, he was partying with them, which, listen, nah, it's not a great look, but I don't know. It didn't seem like anybody was getting harmed. And then uh, then Kyle now is in Aspen. They're all wearing their Kimo Sabe hats as a family, which is the way you want to do it. But uh, she is talking about her weight loss. She's talking about, you know, becoming stagnant with her weight loss. So she's switching up her exercise routine, still has never admitted to doing Ozempic, which I think maybe in Kyle's case, she didn't because when you give up alcohol completely and you commit to a really solid workout regime, that does kickstart your body in a very different way. So if anyone, I almost would believe that Kyle Richards is not on Ozempic at all because she's made so many huge life changes that go with actual weight loss that I tend to believe that. But also, I don't care. I don't care who's on Ozempic. I don't care. I just don't. I don't care if Oprah's on it. I don't care if Erica Jane's on it. I don't care. You know, if you have the money, do it. And as long as diabetics don't need it and you're not taking it from them. Um, And I think we talked about that on Sheena's podcast as well. But they're there. We still don't know in terms of what this relationship with Morgan Wade is, even though she is popping up still a lot with Kyle. Uh, Kyle also said in an interview that her and Mauricio are still in therapy. They want the best for each other. They want each other to be happy. And like I said, I don't think this is a prediction, but what my thought was is that I don't think they will ever come back as a couple. I don't know if they'll ever officially pull the trigger and get a divorce, but I think for all intents and purposes, this has been done for a while. But and this might be hard to hear, I think that there is a world in which they do want the best for each other, that not all divorces end in some kind of your, I want you to fucking die. I mean, you might have moments of that, but I genuinely think with the family they've created, and they do seem to have a beautiful family with the wealth that they've created with each other, I think there is a lot to work on and to want to work on with, uh, with people. Does that make sense? Um, But it'll be interesting. I will really look in 2024 of if Kyle is making all of these changes, if she's in therapy, if she's all of these things, you know, what could potentially happen? What will she be able to tell us? What will there be any big revelations in terms of her relationship status? Um, And I'm really curious to see how that goes. Now, I'm going to be doing another episode about Southern Charm, about the this past week's episode, which I thought was fantastic. We're already coming up on the season finale. I guess the next episode is the season finale of this season of Southern Charm. But, uh, you know, I was talking about sometimes your biggest life moves are not going to be on television and it's not going to be fodder for television. And that sometimes is by design. So a lot of these moves that Kyle is making now, I think might be big moves that we're not even aware of because there is not a camera in her face. So she has the freedom to do that because That's the part where I do agree in terms of reality stars is when they're really going through something and the cameras are up, it's really hard. It makes things that much more difficult to actually see how you really feel about something because you have to deal with that. You have to deal with your cast members and then you have to deal with how we respond to that. And I think with Kyle's brave admission about her friend taking her own life and how that affected her, uh, I think that got a lot of empathy from the viewers. And I think she genuinely felt that. But I'm so curious. And what I brought up Southern Charm is that Taylor Shepsex, 
you know, we're going to end this season next week. And we're not, I thought this season was going to include something really tragic that happened to Taylor's brother. Taylor's brother passed away and Olivia's brother passed away in the same season. And we saw that being dealt with on the show, but this now must happen off camera, which we'll probably be able to see at the reunion or hear a little bit about it. And when I heard that, or when I saw that this wasn't going to be covered, when I saw the preview for next week's season finale, my, my main thought was good. Oh my God. Good. Good. You know, I think if it's filmed, I'm going to watch it and I'm probably going to find it magnificent and fascinating reality television. But if it's not, it's good because they're able to have those moments for themselves. They're able to deal that without having a video scrapbook of one of the worst times in their life. No matter what you think of Taylor, no matter how, and by the way, she's made piss poor decisions. No matter what you think of her, nobody can argue how horrible that has to be to lose a sibling. And especially we see how close they were. She calls, she FaceTimes him in last week's episode. I mean, that's really wild. Oh, you guys, back to the Kardashian-Jenner holiday party. I left this out. Uh, I saw this on an account, Bywig Hello Drama, which is great. Here is Northwest with Kathy Hilton and Paris Hilton. No, no, I um so uh <laughs> this was posted on tiktok and instagram and it had the caption of north had no idea what was going on that was kathy hilton singing to North with Paris Hilton going, eh, you know, with her baby, with her babyish voice instead of her deep husky voice we hear in Paris and love season two. But Kathy's like, North is the bestest. What is, what comes after? And North is like Christmas. Um, and I will tell you, I think Northwest is the only person that will be able to take Kathy Hilton down one day. Uh, I, I, Kathy, I would watch your step with North. North will only, Rinna couldn't get the job done, but I think Northwest eventually will. We like Northwest is primarily probably one of the biggest secret weapons America has right now. She could, her power is becoming so great and she's only like nine years old. I mean, and she's dressing, by the way, they had these photographs, these Instagram snaps of Kim and North and North looked awesome, right? She was in her dad's ball main jacket and uh, that he had won a, a war at a fashion show with like weird contacts. You remember, I don't know if you remember that, but um they had these shots and it was a Photoshop fail and Kim has two thumbs in the photo. I mean, God, these guys, and you know, sometimes when you see these people, like I've seen Teresa Giudici and a lot of these housewives in person and they actually look like their photos. I mean, for the most part, Teresa will sometimes go a little bit more overboard than actually how she looked, which is amazing. But I do find it funny. It's like these people already look so amazing and they're still Photoshopping where they get two thumbs. I will never understand that. But Kathy Hilton, like North truly looked like, I don't know what the F is going on. And North, you have to imagine, has been around some uh, very wild people. And she looked potentially scared and what the F and Paris was even explaining like, <laughs> my mom's never done a TikTok photo before. Please forgive us, North. You know, North is one of the queens of TikTok, <laughs> as, as it were. But they always lock comments, which I think is smart on the, the TikToks that North posts. Kim, and I think that is very smart. Do not let us comment on anything with her online yet. It is just, it's just, it, that would be just too dark. We should not be able to say what is in our head sometimes, uh, especially when it comes to kids. Uh, it just, we should have a housewives rule when it comes to any child in social media because, but this, no, I'm telling you, this Northwest is so powerful. So, I'm replaying like Northwest is just way too powerful. And I just don't know how do you go? I just don't know how you come back to earth. It's like, if your life is just seeing amazing thing after amazing thing, I just don't know how I don't, I, I'm, I'm, I'm truly I don't know. Okay. Uh, I wanted to talk about Shannon Storms Bador. Cause we talked about Johnny J earlier. 
Now, Shannon Storms Bedore was on Bravo's Hot Mic podcast, which is very new, but it's hosted by Alex Baskin, who is uh, one of the heads of Evolution uh, Media, who produces Vanderpump Rules, Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, Real Housewives of Orange County. I mean, just the top production company right now, I think, in terms of Bravo reality shows. No offense to all of the other production companies. You're all beautiful. Um, but uh, he has this Bravo Hot Mic podcast, which I think is excellent. The only unfortunate thing is you have to pay for these episodes. But uh, let's see here. I got my information from an a Instagram account called the Blonde Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican. And she made some uh, notes about everything that Shannon said. So let's go over it, shall we? Uh, she says, on the night of the DUI, she took an Uber home, says she's a big advocate for Uber, and her CFO, chief financial officer, always yells at her because her Uber bill is so high, but she left her phone in the car. So she stupidly got in the car and drove to John's three blocks away because she needed help getting her phone back. At John's house, they got in an argument and he asked her to leave. So she got in the car to drive home, which is three blocks away, says that the thought that she could have hurt someone keeps her up at night, which I do believe. Um, she was offered multiple free alcohol rehab stays, but she decided to go to a behavioral wellness place because she wants to figure out why she makes certain toxic decisions in her life. There was an alcohol component to this as well. She was able to do an outpatient program five days a week because the center is literally in her backyard. She says that they're blessed to have such a good facility near them. She discovered that there are certain childhood traumas that she has tried to bury that play a part in certain toxic decisions she makes. She is very aware that she made a horrible decision, says John was very helpful in the wake of her DUI, taking her to doctor's appointments and when paparazzi was around. But she had, has no intention of ever speaking to him again. And I think that probably ties in with what she's talking about in terms of discovering toxic decisions and behavior. David's affair started on October 14th, 2013. Now, this is David, her first husband, Shannon, the, the day after Shannon's first day of filming on Orange County. So David started his affair the first day after filming on Orange County. She says that if BravoCon is in Vegas again, she's bringing Archie and he will have his own meet and greet. I think Archie, I think Archie, I mean, I think we should do an Archie con. I love that dog. The Trace Amigas are planning a tour for 2024, which is interesting news because her and Tamara had a falling out. So hopefully they have patched things up because I think Shannon needs her friends around her now more than ever. So hopefully this is true. Um, I mean, I don't really care about the Trace Amigas shows, but I hope that they have mended that fence. After the DUI, she broke her nose and her arm and she went to go stay with Vicky and Vicky took care of her. Imagine Nurse Gunvalson. And Vicky knows her way around a hospital. We've seen her in one many times. So I think she is potentially a good nurse at this point. But imagine that. Imagine Vicky Gunvalson putting you on the mend. Like imagine, imagine that of like, how's our little patient? Right. Like just coming in. Rah! <laughs> uh, she thinks that Vicky has found the one in Michael, which is her new boyfriend. And I've met Michael now a couple of times and he seems like a nice guy. He was in a boot at BravoCon because he hurt his foot. Um, but uh, he, he, you know, I just had a couple innocuous conversations with him and he seemed like a nice guy she thinks that yeah she says that john was in her ear on the day of the last reunion telling her that she needed to defend him so john jansen old johnny J, getting in shannon's ear now this is a big interview to get i mean now of course that is her ex executive producer alex baskin uh, but i do think like i said in terms of vanderpump rules i think alex genuinely does care about all of these people you know even if we don't like them i think he genuinely does care. And like I said, that's taken me a little of time to get my way around because you're using their life as fodder and there's a commerce element to it. I mean, that's one of the biggest elements is to sell soap, you know, which is why TV was invented, was to have something to sell soap on, to sell products. That's how it all got invented. So there is that element of finance and commerce. And when a major life event happens and you are on a reality television show, it's a really delicate balance. And I think we've all talked about it is that we do know that Shannon is not sometimes the most stable person. She's very emotional. She's very sensitive. And even if I don't agree with some of the decisions she's made or a lot of the things that she said, it's somebody that I still root for. Um, so I'm curious if she does have enough time and space to actually be able to talk about this. I'm glad to hear about the outpatient stuff and they are going to start filming again from what I hear in January. So it'll be interesting to hear this. And that's the thing of like, I wonder in terms of production, if they really are going back and forth of Alexis would be good in a lot of ways because it would be a lot of mess. But is Shannon at a point where we can put her in that type of mess? And you might be thinking, well, then put her on the injured reserve list. Take her out of the game because we want to see it. And if she's not going to do it, fuck her. There might be that element that people have said that. So I don't really know 
what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen in, in terms of Shannon Bedore, but I just worry putting yourself in that environment, especially right now of all times, is the healthiest place for her, even if she's talking healthy. Guys, you know, we can talk healthy all we want, but it doesn't take away that you have to go to bed at night with yourself and those dark thoughts that can creep in and be intruders in the night. You know, all it takes, I mean, you can, you know, darkness can come really quick at any time. You guys know that. Um, so we'll keep an eye on that. I'm really curious to hear, but I mean, obviously Shannon is signed up for the season right now. We'll see what happens. Um, and she, a lot of the spotlight is going to be on her because of this accident. And we already left in a bad place at the reunions because of Shannon, but we have the John Jansen relationship. We have the accident and we have Alexis Bellino. So the spotlight is mainly going to be on Shannon. And I just don't know if she is going to be able to, to do that. I don't know. So uh, it's, it's what I'm thinking about you guys. Okay, three last things, and then we'll get out of here. God, this always goes way longer than I thought or would want, potentially. <laughs> um, okay, I wanted to talk really briefly about the movie Saltburn. Now, um, Emerald Fennell, 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 the director, was on So Bad It's Good uh, about a month and a half ago, I think, and I was so overjoyed to talk to her. I've seen Saltburn two times, and like I said at the time, if, that movie, if I was in high school when that movie came out, it would have probably become my whole personality. I thought it was dynamic in the way that a young person could potentially appreciate it in a way that maybe, you know, we get older cannot. Um, and I think that's good. I think movies should exist for uh, certain demographics. I think it should speak to certain people. And I think there is something magical about when you see a, uh, a movie or you hear an album and when you hear it and, you know, it just, it, it's time and place and a lot of those things and how much experience with you have. I mean, that's why a lot of the pop stars, when I'll listen to like Tate McRae or Sabrina Carpenter, it doesn't necessarily fully move me like, you know, the days of yore with uh, Britney Spears or Christina Aguilera, because those were like my people. And that moved me, but sometimes I find it hard to relate as I get older, but I'm so happy that certain people will be like, oh my God, she's the bee's knees, <laughs> the bee's knees, Jesus God, you know, or even Renee Rapp, who I talked about last week, you know, like I want to hear it. I want to have the ears. I want to have those youthful ears that is able to hear it, able to feel it, have it be able to move me uh, in my life. And, uh, you know, sometimes it just doesn't work that way, but I think movies are the same way. Right. Um, and I think one of the things that I hate about social media so much is our, it's not the rush to judge. Well, it is a rush to judgment. It's I fucking hate it. I hate it. Oh, this is horrible. And it's like, first off, do you know how much, like I said earlier, goes into making these things? Uh, I was talking about this a little bit on the Christmas episode in regards to Maestro, the Bradley Cooper film that's on Netflix now. And I was seeing some of the same discourse and by discourse, I just mean, I fucking hated it. Like that's like, oh, it sucks. It sucks. And it's like, no, it doesn't like even just on a technical level alone, it's amazing. Like if you look at Maestro, some of those shots and yeah, Bradley Cooper is doing these big grand things. He's like that as an actor as well. He's like obsessed with props, smoking a cigarette, the voice, it's a different voice. It's all about that. And yes, there's something masturbatory about that, but I like that. That's I, I'm like that. Are you kidding me? I mean, like, I love those big swings and especially coming from a theater background, I see those things and I'm like, this guy is really trying. And maybe that sometimes is what some people don't like is seeing somebody that like, oh my God, it looks like he's really trying. But I also, I, I, Carrie Mulligan's performance in Maestro is just amazing. It's just amazing because Bradley Cooper has the showy role, which even in being showy, it's so difficult to the amount of work to learn how to conduct a certain piece, to be able to talk, to be able to move, to be able to direct that on top of it. It's just a gargantuan undertaking that blows me away. But Saltburn, a lot of the same way of just Emerald wrote this film you know, put it out there. It's now on Amazon Prime, so you can see it for free. And there's some really intense scenes, especially one with the bathtub, that is uh, potentially, I mean, shocking. Uh, it seems like it's shocking for some people, but it's like, have you seen fucking movies? Have you seen a David Lynch film? Have you seen a Fellini film? Have you seen, like, I mean, have you even seen 80s screwball comedies? Have you seen Revenge of the Nerds? Have you seen American Pie? Like, are you are you kidding me? Like a guy, uh, you know, Barry Keoghan, one of the main actors in Saltburn, does a, a fully nude dance at the end. 
And it's amazing. He does amazing. I was very jealous of his manhood, but also just jealous of the bravery it takes to do that in front of a 30 to 40 person crew. And this guy's dancing around in the nude proudly because that's what his character would do. This character would be like, I now, I don't want to give any spoilers away to the movie. But I do sometimes wish we would actually rethink and how we approach these things that we consume is that like, first off, you know, it, I just found it. It's like it's us, you know, us sitting on our fat asses all day with like a Diet Coke and a block of cheese. I'm talking about myself and then just writing something sucks online. Something sucks. And I'm like, no. The fact that it even exists, even Lifetime movies to a degree, the fact that it even got made, first off, that's, and I know art isn't, you know, you're not supposed to be like, well, I need to know the ins and outs, but the reality of that situation is there are ins and outs to consider. This is a technical medium, filmmaking. There's so many people that work on films to create a world. And I think anybody taking those big swings, which I think Saltburn is a big swing, and I think Maestro is a big swing. And will I ever watch Maestro again? I don't know. I don't know if I will. Maybe scenes. But I think it moved me in certain ways, and I thought the topic was in interesting in certain ways. I still don't know if I really fully know a lot about Leonard Bernstein or what actually moved him, but I think that was also another one of the points, because his life was really a big secret. And that's, you know, he was, you know, a gay man that had a, you know, pseudo successful relationship for a given time, and things got they got got caught up in things, you know, but he had a, a family, his music was second to none, you know, his conducting, I mean, even his stuff with West Side Story, you know, and then the things that moved him and the things that he wanted to share with the world, I thought truly amazing. But I just sometimes will read this and I get so disappointed because I'm like, man, the future of movies is already to me uh, an endangered species in some ways. Like movies will always be made, but in how we present them, how we talk about them. And I think these things are worthy of being talked about. Like, listen, I do a sometimes five day a week podcast talking about the ins and outs of certain moments of reality television. But these things do need to be talked about and they need to be talked about in a semi intelligent way where we can't just throw things away. We want people to come towards things. We don't want to move them away from that. We don't want people to be scared of starting a movie. We don't want people to be like, well, this sucks even before I watch frame one. Because all of this work goes in it. They're trying to share something with us. That's what art is all about. Trying to share something. Trying to share this itch that you can't scratch. This is desire to do a Sisyphus, uh, uh, a Sisyphus, a Sisyphusian, whatever, a task of rolling this big boulder up a hill, having it fall down again and roll it back up. It's, it's like going into war, making any of these things. And I think that you can't just poo-poo something um, that quickly. And I also think we need to live in a world, and I think sometimes we do, that things take time. You know, things sneak up on you. Things will hit you differently a year after you've seen something and you'll reconsider it. So sometimes going out there with your first emotion, well, it might work on talking about reality television, but with other art, sometimes it's not, sometimes you got to sit with things. Sometimes you got to sit in it. You got to sit in the feeling that it gives you. And sometimes if it gives you a weird feeling or if it gives you a strong feeling or if, you, if it gives you a bad feeling, that might be something to look into. And that might be something worthy of exploring, which is so great in so many ways, right? Okay, good. We're in agreement. Oh, also, I just remembered this. When we were driving over to the uh, the graveyard, do you ever do this with music where you play musical roulette and you're like, whatever song comes on right now on Sirius or whatever the radio you're listening to is the song that's going to determine the mood. You know, do you ever do that? And uh, the song that came on was uh, Missing You by John Waite. Do you remember that song from the 80s? I ain't missing you. I can lie to myself. Missing you. I ain't missing you at all. So anyways, it's a great song. Fun, not fun song. It's deep song, but missing you. And I thought that was great going over to the graveyard, but just it's kind of the same expression about movies is what I feel about songs is that that song came on and it gave me a little bit of an electrical charge a little bit of a something to something to hang on to you know something to to grab on to because my feelings were in the gutter but sometimes you'll hear a song at the right moment or you'll watch something at the right time and it gives you a little hope it gives you something and that's what i think is so great about art and especially music 
which on the Patreon, I did a, a, ma- a did a mix the other day, a mashup that I really, really loved that I want to share with you guys. Um, uh, sorry, I just got sent a TikTok video and I was looking at the TikTok video when I was, but I think that's what the great thing is about any kind of art, whether it be Saltburn, Maestro, a song that you're listening to in the car is that it does, it makes you feel a little less alone that like, Ooh, somebody understands or somebody put my feeling into something else and is able to express it in a way that I cannot. And uh, I, I thought that was just amazing. Also, speaking of TikTok, I wanted to talk about uh, one of my obsessions. Um, I've been on TikTok a lot the last week, especially uh, trying to disassociate. And uh, there is something truly magical happening uh, and also potentially frightening is if you're on TikTok, you might be on the Royal Caribbean's Ultimate World Cruise TikTok. Now, if you get one video and you engage with it, all of a sudden you start getting pushed a lot of these videos. And uh, this Royal Caribbean's Ultimate World Cruise is what it is, you guys. It's a cruise that 700 people have embarked on. It's a nine-month cruise that Royal Caribbean is doing. It's hitting all of the continents. It's going to touch four corners of the world in one epic trip. Uh, seven continents, 11 world wonders, and over 60 countries during their nine-month trip. And even the base level price for this was like $65,000. And then it goes upwards because there, of course, is a cast system on the boat that, you know, like there's actually, you know, there's a, there's a list within a list of people that have paid way more, more. But if you've been on TikTok, you've probably seen this. And if you haven't, go search for it because it is going to become its own reality show. And not in the sense that they're actually filming this, even though they should, but you can piece together another enough TikToks to understand what's going on and kind of create your own reality show. But imagine that, like nine months on a cruise ship. And yeah, it kind of sounds all right, but it sounds like a nightmare. It sounds like we're like, this is potential Titanic material that's eventually going to happen. There's already a cast of characters. I've already seen a bunch of people that I now follow religiously where we'll go and we'll watch them and what they're doing, what they're eating that day. They've already uh, thought that maybe one of the... uh, One of the couples on the month cruise are swingers because they put a pineapple on their door. But uh, looking into it closer, the pineapple has to be upside down for it to mean that you're into swinging, I guess. And this lady's pineapple was right side up. But I did take a great tour of her Royal Caribbean's cabin, and it was very nice. But uh, this thing I'm, uh, I'm obsessed with. I'm obsessed with. Like, you know, certain people... I've just followed their adventures and we're only, I mean, we're only a couple of weeks into this trip, a nine month trip. I mean, can you, the sodium intake alone, I mean, I need to see before and after photos, but you guys know what I'm talking about. I need to try to interview somebody that's on this cruise at some point, just to really kind of get into the minutia of it. But it's a recommendation if you're desperate for uh, something to watch, which I don't think anybody is at this time of year, but if you are, Get on the Ultimate World Cruise TikTok. It is truly, truly insane. It is worth your... Okay, I've gone too far, too long. I have more stories to cover, but you know what? There'll be another day. Uh, Also, I'm just seeing on Twitter that Vicki Gunvalson, classy Vicki Gunvalson, Lincoln bio... Uh, she wrote, this is gross, full report here. And it's the John Jansen thing, but it's literally a Lincoln bio. Like, (laughs) click here. And she gets money for every click. And I think that's classic housewives. Uh, I hope you guys are having the best Thursday, the best Wednesday, the best Wednesday ever. Uh, I'm going to right after this do uh, my Southern Charm episode. So you'll probably get two episodes today, which will count as your Wednesday and your Thursday episode. But uh, I'm excited to talk about Southern Charm. And I want to talk a little bit about the money that Taylor Swift has brought in this year. So that'll be on that episode as well. And uh, we will talk to you very soon. Bye, guys.